Back on Morning Line, our final segment this morning, Stephanie Witz with us. She is Executive Vice President of the Beacon Center of Tennessee. It's good to have you on. Thanks, Thanks. for having me. They're stewards paying attention to the money being spent federally or state and block grants and the like. And we were talking about, you know, TANF and SNAP and TenCare. And, um, you know, you wonder about all the needs and the money that has to be spent on this. Uh, we were talking during the break about the, the poverty level again. Now, Tennessee, you said, is above the level of the rest of the country in several categories, right? Yeah, we are statewide poverty level is higher than the national average, which makes us think there is a need for this sure. money um, out there. Um, but also that uh, children in Tennessee, it's over 20% of children living in Tennessee are in poverty, which is a staggering number when you look at it statistically and across the board. Um, we really think that a focus should be put on um, helping families move out of, of poverty because if they are in poverty, it's likely that their children will follow that same cycle and we have to approach it from a two-generational approach. It's interesting and again that would be one in five or one in six children mm -hmm. in the state and think about your neighborhood and you see children running around and you know wherever one in six could be um, and we use the word poverty mm -hmm. all right and it's, it's interesting we, we are you hear poverty and you think okay what, what yes. comes to mind when you hear poverty and that's like oh well you're poor you don't have means um, t for certain you know important basics in your life when you say a child's in poverty, okay, that means obviously their parents are in poverty as mm -hmm. well. And that means they're not getting what? I mean, how bad does it have to be? If you're living in poverty, where's that line from poverty where you're not quite in poverty? What do you think? I, as far as what they need? Yeah, I mean, yeah, where is I it? Mean, I mean, does that mean they, you're in poverty if you can't have three meals a day? Are you in poverty if you can't afford to buy a pair of shoes? I mean, I, I know those are more just, you know, it depends on how you spend the money, but what makes, there's a poverty line on what your income is, and that's yeah, basically a, where they set it, right? Yeah, there's a federal definition. It changes every year um, on what exactly it is based on inflation. Um, but when you think about a kid in poverty, you're thinking about, you know, are they able to eat breakfast before they go to school? Mm -hmm. you know, do are they, they hungry when they're they sitting hungry? in class? Do they have um, clothes to wear to school, clean clothes to wear to mm -hmm. school? Um, uh, do they have opportunities available to them for supports after school, like tutoring or different type of educational attainment opportunities? Those are things that you think about. Um, and it's hard to think about anything else when you're thinking about where your next meal is going to come from. Yep. I don't even know how they, and you know, we, we've heard of stories where there's kids that are there, and this is through Ten Care and more medical, um, and that's going to be maybe a block grant, as we talked about earlier. They're in school, and, and the state has a great program where d dentists do visit, especially some of these more rural counties, but wherever there's poverty. That's so cool. And there's kids in there with abscesses in their mouth that are attending classes because their family doesn't have the money to take them. Have you ever had a toothache? Yeah. That's the worst. You know, toothaches or earaches. I mean, yeah. and, and there's kids sent to school with bad teeth. And thank goodness there's this program yeah. to address that. We have a, a large amount of nonprofits in the state that do really great work. And through state programs. And through state programs. It's a state program, a, a state program that what, what amazes me is that some people don't, or they look at it as handouts or whatever. I've actually heard that there are some of these rural schools where the, the teachers aren't all that welcoming because they think, oh, this is money, you know, this shouldn't be at their parents. And I'm like, I want to hit those teachers in the head. I mean, come on, if you have a child in your class yeah. with an abscess in your mouth and it needs to be fixed, period. I don't want to hear any of your complaints about how you think the money's being spent or not. You fix the kid's mouth. Yeah. I would I pay for it out of my own pocket. Yeah, I think there are a lot of kids across the state that could use something similar to that. I know. And so it's a, it's a great program. But again, when we talk about a lot of this money being set aside and being spent, you just wonder if that means it's it's creating this problem, which you say Tennessee's ahead of the national average. You think that number could come down with regard to poverty and some of these other issues if they would spend more of that money in TANF? Uh, yes. If, I don't if think there's we, any question, yeah, right? If we took an intentional focus and actually looked at what do the families need that are, that are struggling, right. then I think you would have a change because you provide those supportive services so you can help them move up that economic ladder. You know, sometimes uh, we've talked to families where we've asked them, you know, where do you want to be in five years? And people are, have told us, well, nobody's ever asked me that question yeah. before. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting to think about because, you know, they haven't had the supportive wraparound services to give them those long-term supports of, to get to the next step. Mm -hmm. And so if we want people to work and we're expecting them to work, um, it, these, this is the program that, <laughs> that you should yes. support more than anything because it's supporting work. Yep. And then you get them and they contribute to society as a whole. And, and your community is better overall. Exactly. And it's not, yeah, so it's not, not just about 
helping others, which is the most important thing, but it's, it helps us all. Yes. As a whole. I mean, let's go to Roxy. Roxy, good morning. Hi, Roxy. Hi. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. My question, or it might be a comment, I live in a senior subdivision like mm -hmm. condos, and she mentioned something about the SNAP program. 90% mm -hmm. of us get $15 a month in food stamps. And we were told we wouldn't get that if the federal government did not make them give it to us. And a lot of us draw just basic SSI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't think that's fair. $15 buys bologna bread and coffee. Yep. If it wasn't for the churches and all, a lot of the people wouldn't be eating. Mm -hmm. I, you know and what? I think, yeah. That's just wrong. I think our... Yes, it is very wrong. Our state could do more to help the seniors. How about we that? Yeah, we talked about children, mm -hmm. and she brings that up, and we were going to touch on SNAP a bit, which, again, is the food stamp program, $15 a month. Yeah, so SNAP is one of those programs that mm -hmm. is very federally mm -hmm. mandated. So that's yeah. something that we can't change at the state level. It would have to take a federal change. Um, but that is a complaint that we've heard from uh, senior citizens is that there is that um, that lower amount of SNAP that you receive mm -hmm. as an elderly person versus a household of, of three or four. Yeah. Um, and it does make a huge difference when they're on a fixed income. Sure. Um, well, and she just talks about they get by. I mean, if they're on SSI, you know, or Social Security, depending yeah. on how much, that's not a lot of money. And, and and you do, we talk about how there's more people, you know, Social Security was never meant to be something that you live on. Yeah. I mean, meaning that alone. Well, we don't even know if, we're, if uh, we, I'll get it. We don't even know if we'll get it, but you hope you have means. But a lot of people yeah. didn't have. They had to spend the money they earned when they earned it, and I understand that. And then they get this. So that's why a program like SNAP, to supplement whatever it is they can get by on whatever meager Social Security, they check they get. Mm -hmm. Is it um, the thinking that it snaps more important maybe in some way to go to families with children than to seniors? I think they're looking at it from the household size. Just um, how many? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. If there's more, right? Yes. Um, household size and then also what other supplements you're getting from the federal government. So she mentioned Social Security and SSI, right. um, which are two programs that are, that are meant. Medicare, of course, um, for senior citizens as well. Um, not saying that it's fair, but I think that's the look at, they're looking at it from a totality perspective of these are all the programs that are available and SNAP is a supplement to help with food but not pay for all your food. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, as far as SNAP's concerned, any issues with regard to that as you've looked at it um, when we're talking about in terms of it's federally, it's set up, there, there's no wiggle room for the state to mess with the money that comes in on that, right? Right. And interestingly enough, one thing that we did find was that during the recession, the state had a waiver of work requirements. So with SNAP, if you're an able-bodied adult who doesn't have any children, you and you're not elderly, you're within 18 um, to 49 years old, mm -hmm. you're required to work or volunteer 20 hours a week. Um, but we had waived that as a state during the recession, which is what you should sure, do. Because, yeah. um, but slowly over time, they've added counties back in. But what we found is that there are still seven counties that were waived of the work requirements, which we couldn't find the disparity between other counties and why, why one's those waived seven. And one's not. Yeah. Um, and so because we have such low unemployment rates um, and looking at counties, we really think that work is the next step for, for folks. Um, and so we recommended that they um, put those seven counties back in. Okay, yeah, so there's still seven, are, are any of them in Middle Tennessee off the top no, of your head? No, they're not. They're more of the rural outside. Correct. Okay, but seven still continue to have it where um, adults can get SNAP. Yes, uh, and you okay. can still get it in the other, uh, counties. Right, but the requirements you are a little to, bit greater yeah, on those fronts. They're a little bit greater, more stringent. Okay, yeah, it's great. So SNAP, I mean, I, I had forgotten about it. I don't even know if they still have, you know, situations where you can go get surplus cheese and I foods and stuff like that, but food stamps are, are a big deal, and uh, just $15 of food stamps a month doesn't go real far. It doesn't. Some of these programs getting cut. Well, that just again, all the more reason. As we wrap things up here, then what would you say for individuals watching this that maybe, you know, want to see this change or want to see the money spent or something they just call their lawmakers or what what you know I know there's been comment periods but what do you think can you know the average individual can do yeah absolutely if you feel passionately about it you can always write folks that haven't uh, that are the in charge of spending the money um, and ask them you know to, yeah. to help in different ways but I do want to assure people that I think people are going to take a look at it um, it is a big issue and I think that uh, the General Assembly will will take a look at it and yeah. see going forward this is a huge opportunity. Let's not 
let's not waste it. Yeah, having all that money. So you think there's a chance, who knows, maybe next year, and I don't know if it's built around fiscal years or whatever yeah. when that money comes in, that maybe then they start, instead of spending just what it was, like you said, 71 million, um, or rather, no, they, they um, 37% of the money, they may spend 80 to 90% of the money. And you still wouldn't have to touch the reserve fund. Oh, you wouldn't <laughs> have to touch it. And if, so that so, reserve fund, by the way, is still sitting there. Yeah. The point being is, don't have to add any more to right. it. Right. There's a you could spend an extra 120 million dollars a year to help needy families without having to even touch that reserve fund. Right. That would be it. Where can people go to, to read more of the information that the Beacon Center came up with? You guys um, have a website? Yes, right. uh, beacontn.com. Um, take a look at it, and our research is out there. How many members there with you guys? I mean, you work over there. Is it's where, where's Beacon based? In, in Nashville. It's just um, in, uh, okay. yeah, we're a statewide think tank, but we're based in Nashville. Okay. And uh, yeah, go to that and uh, just monitor, you know, the, how the spending is done and where the money goes. And I think uh, I'd like to see more of it spent, like you said. I think Absolutely. Good for you guys. Looking. Hey, listen, thank you, thank you. for coming on really and congratulations. Thank you. We're she excited. told me it's a little baby boy. <laughs> well, so that's uh, very exciting. <laughs> yes, it's nice you. of you to come on this morning. We'll take a break. I'll be back with a programming note right after this. Stay with us.